we can know him. He has revealed himself to us. We have been set apart to follow him. This is a call to faith, to perseverance, to know and follow him. In confidence, we declare that nothing is better than Jesus. And so let me begin by just telling you, uh, you a quick uh, a little uh, story of what, uh, uh, not really story, but like an experience I've just recently had. And so uh, I, I was reading a book, uh, a book that uh, uh, when I became a Christian, uh, lots of people were telling me that it's a book that you must read. It's a, it's a biography called The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, and it is really a story about how her family actually managed to save so many Jew- Jewish lives during Nazi Germany's occupation of Holland. And so in, those, in, in the book, she actually speaks about this particular lesson that her dad taught her regarding knowledge. And so she had been exposed to some uh, information about sex from a poem in, at school. And so she asked her dad about it. And so to which her dad then proceeded to actually uh, uh, illustrate something to her with this lesson at the heart of it. And so she said to, to Corey, uh, Corey Ten Boone, and she said this, listen, in our stages of development in life, in life, there is certain knowledge that might be too heavy for us to actually carry on our own. And so at those moments, we actually need to trust someone perhaps more mature than we are, like our father, to actually carry that particular knowledge for us until such a time we would be ready to actually carry it ourselves. And so I thought that was just brilliant parenting advice, uh, advice, that we've got to help our children in their stages of development to develop in appropriate levels and pace, uh, and pace, teaching them to actually trust us as, they, as their parents with certain knowledge that, is, that they aren't ready yet to carry for themselves. But no one remains a child forever, Right? So no one remains a child forever. At some point in time, you would have to grow up. Uh, You would have to grow up. And so there will come a time where where you will need to take responsibility for maturity of understanding so that you can carry certain knowledge with you yourself, uh, yourself being able to apply it in your own uh, own life. Now, the same uh, uh, applies when you think about our spiritual development as, as well as Christians, that there is certain knowledge that we have to, at points, trust people who are perhaps more spiritually mature than we are to carry it for us. But there must come a time on our spiritual journey where we become mature enough, uh, enough but uh, become mature enough to be able to actually carry that knowledge ourselves, being able to apply that truth into our lives ourselves. Now, at the end of the previous subsection that we were dealing with in the book of Hebrews, I said that the gospel uh, message is not a simplistic message. It is actually complex. And that the writer of Hebrews is about to get into some of the complexity around the gospel message, which will require a maturity of understanding. That you will need a maturity and understanding in order to carry it with you, to be able to apply it in your life. And it is that maturity of understanding that the gospel, uh, that the author of Hebrews wants to press into our lives. He wants to call us to actually be able to grow in our and the maturity of understanding so that we would absolutely understand what he has to say to us. And so what he's about to get into in chapters 5 to chapter 7, he wants to explain uh, explain why Jesus is the better high priest. A better high priest, which is a, 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 a knowledge or truth, a gospel truth that requires a maturity of understanding, which he wants to press his audience on. And so he's essentially saying to them, listen, you need to grow up. You need to grow up if you're to actually understand why Jesus is a better high priest. And so therefore, why Jesus Christ? Nothing is better than Jesus Christ. Now, here's how this section is actually broken up. And so, and so it's broken up uh, uh, in, a, in a particular way. He's been very intentional in how he wants to present his message. Yeah? And so chapter 5 and chapter sev- uh, 7, so most of chapter 5 and chapter 7 will actually explain and expand on the idea, idea of why Jesus' priest, uh, priesthood is so unique. 
and how much we're needed in our lives. And so most of chapter five and chapter seven will be getting into that. But then in the part sandwiched in the middle, uh, uh, in the middle, uh, uh, middle, he's actually going to be exhorting and calling and uh, calling his audience to actually grow up, that you need a maturity of understanding if you're to fully grasp what he is explaining on either side of, of, of his material, chapter five and chapter seven. Now, listen, let me just be straightforward with you. The instruction to grow up isn't pleasant to receive, is it? Have you ever been in a situation where someone has said, you need to grow up? It's actually, it's not pleasant, uh, pleasant. But if you heed that instruction, it can actually unfold and uh, uh, actually unpack for you just uh, a, a greater level of, of, of benefit and fruit for your life. And so equally, as we approach the subsection in the book of Hebrews, we shouldn't anticipate that it will be pleasant for us to hear what the author has to say. But if we heed his exhortation. There's just great, untold, many blessings for us in the subsection of Hebrews. And so let's jump into it, the first part, uh, part of chapter 5, chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, and let's read what the writer of Hebrews has to say to us. And so he writes and he says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when, um, when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he, also, uh, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest of the, the order of Melchizedek. And so before we unpack these verses, we actually need to take a step back, uh, back and actually understand why we need a high priest. Why? We need a high priest. Now, maybe some of you uh, on Zoom are thinking at this moment, who said that I needed a high priest? Precisely my point. Because we're living in an age, in a day and age, where this need for a high priest is made to seem somewhat obsolete and irrelevant in our lives, or, or, uh, in our lives, or only relevant for those who will consider themselves religious enough. But for the most part, what, what use as the modern person? God for a high priest, a priest altogether. Surely we can get by with our lives without ever needing one, right? Now, perhaps, and only if you are some or some are sovereign over your own life. And by that, I mean that reality is as you would truly define it. Uh, define it. And so, so, uh, and so if you were truly sovereign over your own life, and, and by that meaning that you, uh, this world and your existence in this world was solely in your hands to define, then what use could you need for a high priest? Then you could just write your own script of life altogether all, all without ever needing any help. But... If what we had covered already in chapter one is actually true, when we looked at a few questions as, as, as it pertains to our origin, 
And so where do we come from as it pertains to our purpose? What, what's the meaning to our lives as it pertains to this, uni, uh, this universe, uh, universe uh, that is so complex and yet possesses the unique conditions needed to make life possible on our planet that could not have been a random act. Then we concluded back in chapter one that there must be an ultimate being, God, who has created us and spoken to us, made himself known to us for our ultimate good. And so you don't define reality as the creature. God does as your creator. And so that means then your existence in this universe that he has created must be submitted. It must be submitted to his sovereign rule. Then we proceeded to what we saw in the previous text, in this conundrum that we had to wrestle with in the text. And so what was the conundrum? That this God that has created us, who has spoken to us for our ultimate good, that God is not as approachable as you may think. But, yes, the good news, he is far more approachable than you could ever think. And so in his holiness and in your sinfulness, that God cannot be approached based on your own merit. You cannot approach God that way. But the good news of the gospel is that based on Jesus Christ's merit, in Christ, that can be made, made to come for you, that God is far more approachable than you can ever imagine. And it is in the closeness and nearness of his presence that we experience his supernatural help provided to us to give us all that we need to lead this life in a way that pleases him. But then what needed to happen in order for you to actually be able to enter into the presence of God? Someone needed to have gone before you. Someone whom God would allow close enough to himself. Plead your case. Intercede on your behalf so that God in turn can look at you with a big smile on his face and say, of course you too can come near and draw near to me and receive all that you could ever need. That's what you need. It. And that's what a high priest does he takes you and brings you close to God, makes you approachable to God. This God whom you need, whom you need for your ultimate good, and yet in your sin, you could not get close to the right kind of high priest is able to take you and present you as acceptable before the living God. And so make no mistake this morning, despite what this world may be telling you, and especially in, uh, in the aspirations of our Western society, where we make tolerance and self-love, these kind of absolute values that then nullifies the concept of conditional acceptance. And then, the, and then somehow through that, then we start to actually uh, 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 make God to be, out, uh, uh, to be this kind of person, this kind of be, uh, being who is always affirming and never condemning. Listen, you need the right kind of high priest, the right kind of high priest to be able to draw you close so that you can relate with the true and living God. And what is the good news of the gospel? As seen in Hebrews 4 verse 14, the good news of the gospel is this, that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. That's the good news that that high priest you have, and his name is Jesus Christ. And what makes him so great is that he is a high priest of a different order, of a different class which then brings us to this text that we are having then to deal with. Now, what the author of Hebrews is doing, he wants his audience to be able to see this, why Jesus is a high priest of a better order. And so in order for them to be able to, to understand that, he wants to walk them through a few 
key points about regarding a, pre, a, a high priest so that they can see the insufficiency, the insufficiency of the old order of high priest. And so listen, this morning, as I, as I was uh, positioning it out, we will need a maturity of understanding here. We would have to press through because what we are about to look at will require us to really trek through and try really hard to understand what he's trying to explain to us. And so it will be very much an, an explaining sort of kind of sermon that we have to trek with. But if we do trek with, my hope is that we will discover a Christ like no other who is beautiful in every way. Uh, way worthy of our worship. And so four things we need to understand. Four things we've got to understand, wrestle with, concepts we've got to wrestle with when it comes to a high priest, which hopefully leads us to a place where we can start to see the insufficiency of that old order, a high priest. And so the first thing to understand about a high priest is this, that he mediates between God and people. He mediates between God and people. Verse 1 of our text. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men, people, in relation to God. And so that verse then means, what it is implying, it is implying that the original state of relationship between God and people is unhealthy. It is unhealthy, not by God's doing, but by actually people's sin. And so that's why the high, pri uh, the high priest has to, is appointed to act, on, be uh, uh, to act uh, on behalf of men in relation to God. And then the verse continues to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins because that relationship is unhealthy. And so our problem of sin, what has it done? It has actually broken the relationship. With God, uh, with God. Now, here's how you can understand sin. And so uh, sin, uh, uh, what sin is, it is simply every single time we set ourselves up. We set ourselves up as sovereigns over our lives. And love, refusing God's will and refusing his word over our lives that no, we will go our own way. That's what is at the heart, the essence of sin. And that kind of insolence and affront before God, God never allows. He will never allow. He will never support uh, uh, such insolence. And so that's why the relationship between people and God is broken. It is broken. Uh, broken. And so there needs to be some kind of uh, mediation that needs to happen if people are to find their way to God. Mediation needs to happen so that we can find our way towards, uh, towards this God. And that's why the, need, uh, uh, the high priest needs to operate in that space to sort of kind of bridge the gap, a uh, gap that is existing because between God and people in relationship, uh, in relationship. Now, this then means, if you're just thinking it through, uh, uh, through that if our sin is what has actually broken our relationship with God, then this means this, that if you do not think yourself culpable before God, you can never have a chance of a relationship with Him. If you do not think yourself culpable before God, you can never have a chance at a relationship with Him. Uh, with him. Because God, you and God don't start out on the same footing, on equal footing where perhaps it is God that needs to justify himself before you. No, it is you who's in need of justification before God. And if you do not understand that and see that, you end up blinding yourself, gouging your own eyes out at the good news, the truth of the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there's a need for mediation to happen between people and God because of their sins. Now, in the Old Testament, the way that the Old Testament provided for that mediation to happen, uh, happen is in the Day of Atonement. You can go and read it in detail in Leviticus 16. And so what would happen on that day, which would happen once a year, 
once a year. And only the high priest could do this. The high priest will pick out two goats from amongst the people of Israel. The one, one goat would be slaughtered, sacrificed as a sin offering, as offering symbolizing what? The penalty of the sin of the people being paid. And then what then the high priest then would do with the second goat, is, uh, which is the scapegoat, lay his hands on the head of that of, of, of the scapegoat and then confess on behalf of the people all of their sins on that scapegoat. And then the scapegoat will be released into the wilderness, symbolizing what? That, uh, that the sins of the people have been taken away. They have been atoned for before the presence of God. And so the high priest mediates between God and people. Second thing to see, that he mediates between God and people by being in the people's corner. By being in the people's corner. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. And so there is this uh, old uh, uh, legal saying that goes like this, that a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. Just think about that for a moment. A man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. Why? Why? Because of, uh, because of all the things that could be, uh, uh, go on in a courtroom. First of all, you need some level of expertise in law to actually be able to represent. But then also, most importantly, you actually, when, whenever uh, you're involved in a court case, you actually need great objectivity. And you need some uh, great composure, be removed from the situation so that you can actually, uh, actually try that case to the best of your ability. And so if you will represent yourself, self, it becomes quite impossible to have the objectivity and the composure that's needed to actually be able to put a good case forward. And so a man who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. Now, if it would not be prudent, just unwise, to represent yourself uh, for self in carnal matters like our courts, then how foolish would it be to dare try represent yourself in eternal matters before the living God? How foolish would that be? And not only that, but what this text wants us to see and not only would it be foolish to dare try to stand and, and act as your own high priest before the living God, but actually you need a high priest who will be in your corner. Who will be in your corner. Who will look to mediate between, you, uh, between God and you by actually fully understanding what is going on in the situation and really be in your corner and mediate for you like no one else. You don't want a high priest who's going to go before the living God and deal with your case as if it's just many in the list, of, uh, 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 as if it's one in the list of many. Oh, okay, I've got a few uh, more that I've got to get to, uh, through, a thousand of them, and so quickly, okay, you come through and say, no, you want one who would take it seriously. And so think about this. If you had a court case pending at the courts, at the courts upon which your life depended on, and so you needed to mount a formidable defense. You don't want a lawyer who <laughs> will just take it haphazardly, right? In fact, what would you want? You will want some guarantees. Some guarantees that he will actually defend. Your defense counsel will take it so seriously and defend you as if their own lives depended upon it, right? Now, think on this. What sort of guarantee would you need a high priest to give to you so that you can trust that he will mediate on your behalf before God like no one else? That he would do his very best to mediate between you and God. What sort of guarantee would you need from a high priest? In the logic of the text, the only possible guarantee you can ever need from a high priest is if he himself 
fully understands what it is like to be in your shoes before the living God. That's the only guarantee. That, that some are, they themselves uh, they themsel- share in the guilt of our weaknesses. And so that, that high priest knows that it is only a matter of time when one day his number will be up. And it will be him who will be in the dock before the living God. And it will be him who will need a high priest like no other to actually mediate, mediate before God, uh, uh, before God on his behalf. And so the only uh, kind of the assurance that you could ever need from the high priest to give you the confidence that you need that, man, I am trusting the right kind of high priest to represent me before God is if he himself is beset with our weaknesses, shares in this guilt of sin that we have before the living God. And so he then approaches the living God with all the seriousness in the world, mediating as if his own life depended on it. That's the kind of guarantee you will need. You will need. Now, there is a problem, however. And so as much as we need that kind of guarantee, that kind of high priest who shares in our guilt so that he will mediate with all the seriousness in the world before the uh, living God, it actually creates another complication, <laughs> another complication. And so we want a high priest who shares in our sin, in, in, in our sin, to be able to mediate for us. But if he shares in our sin and he approaches the living God and say, God, I am here on so-and-so's case so that you would have mercy on so-and-so. So God could in reverse look at him and say, and who gives you the right to be talking? Since you share in the same guilt as they do. You see that complication? Okay, let me illustrate it this way. Let me illustrate it this way. So we are seeing lots of corruption happening in our country at a government level, right? And so imagine two officials who are guilty of corruption are being presented before the courts to actually tr- uh, try to uh, plead their case. And when the first one is called to plead their case, who does he present for his chief defense counsel? The other one to defend him. Now, those of us who know of the guilt of the, two, uh, of the two watching all this will think, what? It's a joke that either one of them, that either one of them would think, uh, think that they could defend the other, right? We will think that that's nothing but a joke. Now, why? Why would we think that? Here's why. Because we can already see that neither one of them has got enough credibility in over the issue because of their guilt. So that's why we will think it's nothing but a joke. You cannot defend this thing because you are just as guilty as, as this person, right? And so we will think it nothing but a, jo- a, a joke. And so there then is the complication that we somehow need a high priest who's actually able, able to share in our guilt so that we would have confidence in him but then, which brings us to the third point, he somehow also needs to be blameless enough, blameless than we are, to actually be able to mediate on our behalf. That while he shares in our guilt, he somehow needs to be blameless enough, but not be, uh, 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 sort of be separate from that guilt so as to stand with some level of credibility because he will lack any credibility, lack any credibility if he's on guilt still hangs over his head, which is then why verse 3 tells us, tell, uh, uh, tells us that, um, that, uh, that he is obligated, verse 3, to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And so he first needs to deal with his own guilt first so that he will be blameless enough in order to mediate on our be off. I hope you see that. I see that. But this is where the heart of Hebrews is so careful, intentional. He's been walking his audience right up to this point so that they can now begin to start to see the insufficiency of that old order high priest. And so I need you to stick with me. 
Stick with me, <laughs> yeah, because it's so important that you see this. That it is actually, there's a, underneath a fundamental insufficiency to that old, old our high priest. Because there is actually in that, once you understand that, that he needs to somehow be just as guilty as we are, yet be blameless enough to actually mediate on our behalf, there is actually an irreconcilable dilemma in that midst. In, in, in that midst. Even though the Old Testament provided for the high priest on the day of atonement to actually atone for his own sins first, but atoning for his own sin first, before then he deals with the sin of the people, there's an irreconcilable dilemma in that. And here is, uh, uh, here, here is uh, where it is. Because if you have been tracking with me so far in this, this, here's essentially what I've said. I've said that because of my sin, and put yourself in that place, because of my sin, I cannot approach God, get close enough to God to actually act as my own high priest. And that's why I need another high priest, someone else to actually mediate on my behalf. But if that high priest is to share my own guilt so that I could have confidence in him and yet be blameless enough to actually be allowed to enter into God's presence and mediate on my behalf, then he's got to atone for his own sins first, which the day of atonement provided for. But there is the dilemma, the problem, the problem. It's a double standard because how can God be saying to me that I cannot come close enough to him because of the guilt of my own sin to mediate on my own behalf and yet turn to the high priest and say, I turn for your own sins before me so that I can allow you to mediate on his behalf. Double standard. The dilemma there. Because God will be allowing the high priest to do for himself what he prevents me from doing for myself, and that's why I need a high priest to actually bridge that gap. You see that? And so there is a dilemma, fundamental dilemma in this old order of priesthood. And so then what does that mean? It is saying to us that that old order of priesthood, of, of priesthood has got actually a fundamental insufficiency to it that it cannot be fully sufficient for, you know, for who is then atoning for the sins of the high priest that then allows him to be able to stand with someone, some form of credibility before the living God and atone for our own sins. So there is an insufficiency, a fundamental insufficiency to that old order. Now, for that old order to somehow be allowed to work, it needed, the fourth point, God's endorsement. It needed the endorsement of God for it to work because it's got a fundamental flaw, a fundamental insufficiency to it. And so how could it be allowed to work? How could it be allowed to stand? Well, it could only stand because God endorsed it. Because God endorsed it. Look at verse 4, uh, 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 verse 4 of our text. And no one takes this honor for himself. Don't they? To mediate as a high priest on your own doing, on your own authority, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. And so God had to endorse this, uh, th this for two particular reasons. Stick with me. He had to endorse it for, so that A, it could actually guarantee, despite its insufficiency, that God was forgiving the sins of the people. God had to endorse it for that because it didn't, it, it's got some, something missing to it. And so God has to endorse it so that the people can be assured that God is forgiving our sins regardless. And so what they, then does it mean? It means from the Old Testament to the New, people were always saved by God's grace. They couldn't have rested on the, on the sufficiency of their high priest. It had to be by the grace of God because that old order of high priest was missing something fundamental to it and yet God forgave their sins anyway. And so it was needed to guarantee the forgiveness of God for sins. The second reason why God's endorsement is needed is so that it will guarantee, listen, and here's the good news of the gospel, that in light of its insufficiency, that God must have had a better order or high priest planned along that he was going to one day bring about. 
Because if you think about it, how can God, the God who lacks no credibility, no credibility, allow for something this is sufficient to stand before him? The only way that this could be allowed is if God knew that he was always going to rectify the issue, the fundamental problem, by actually presenting a better order of high priest that had to come. And so the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron, its lineage in the, in, the, uh, in the people of Israel was always meant to remind them constantly as they are watching this thing play itself out on the day of atonement. And if they will think about it closely and use a maturity of understanding or start to see, but wait a minute, there's a fundamental flaw, a fundamental dilemma missing here. And yet God is still forgiving, of, uh, forgiving us our sins through it. We can believe that. It was always meant to actually let, uh, remind them that there has to be a better order that will come one day. Upon which God's forgiveness will be founded upon. A high priest who will one day be endorsed by God share in our guilt and yet be blameless enough to mediate on our behalf. That high priest could not have come of that old order. He must be of a better order to come. Must be of a better order to come, which then brings us to the final point this morning. Jesus Christ is the high priest we need of a better order. Jesus Christ is the high priest we need of a better order. Because here's what you need to understand about the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. Verse 5 to 10, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. He didn't. But was appointed, endorsed by him, God, who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order, the class of Melchizedek. And so what does the author of Hebrews does? He takes Psalm 2 verse 7 and Psalm 110 verse 4 and he puts them together so that we can see what? That we can see how Jesus' sonship and priesthood are connected to one another. And so God has endorsed and appointed his son as the high priest of that better order that we need. Now, someone could object here and say, but that, doesn't that sound like some kind of nepotism happening within the Godhead? That God would just appoint his son to this place of honor to this better uh, place. Why would he do that without merit? And so you have to read on to actually see the merit of Jesus Christ, why he is appointed as this high priest of a better order. Verse 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus' flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was hurt because of his reverence. And so at the pinnacle, at the critical, most important point of his atoning work on our behalf, Jesus cried and he prayed and he asked his father what? Father, spare me the brutal and agonizing death of the cross. He prayed that prayer. And what was his father's answer? No. No to your death on the cross. Do you feel like in your life you're crying out to God, praying, and it seems like God is saying no? Christ, your Lord, got a no from his father. Spare me, spare me the pain, the suffering, the suffering that I'm going to endure at the cross. And he got no to your death on the cross. You will die on that cross. But yes to your resurrection from the grave. That's what he got. No to your death on the cross. Yes to your resurrection on the grave. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
is speaking to us. And here's what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is saying to us. It is saying and to us that Jesus Christ was vindicated. Vindicated as the sinless man. Man, that he was vindicated, blameless in every way. And that's why the grave could not hold him. Because if there was anyone who deserved life after death, then Christ Jesus would be the one. Because he was sinless in every way. And so the resurrection is saying that Christ Jesus is this blameless, sinless person. And so by appointing Jesus Christ, the sinless, blameless God-man as our high priest, what is God doing? God is giving you the only chance at redemption you have before his eyes. Because Christ Jesus, as then the high priest in his sinlessness and blamelessness, does not need to atone for his own sins first before he's allowed to mediate before God. And so therefore, what does it mean? It means his priesthood, his high priesthood doesn't lack credibility. He can act. He can act as the one who fully understands what we're going through because he took on our flesh and yet blameless than we are, can actually mediate on our behalf without any doubts as to whether he's credible enough to act on our behalf. And so when he is appointed the high priest of a better order, God is saying, I love you so much that I will save you by the only way possible through my son, my one and only son. And that's why he's a high priest of a better order. And then the author goes on to then explain more of the benefits, the merits of Jesus Christ. Verse eight, although he was a son he learned obedience through what he suffered. And so what does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ was in a unique relationship with his father, in a unique relationship with him, so close to his father. And yet Jesus Christ chose to submit himself to the will of his father, even if it meant his death on the cross. Submit, submit. If there was anyone who deserved not to die, it would be him but he chose to submit to the will of his father. That's the opposite of what we do as humans. We resist the will of God over our lives. And so we become sinners. So he learned obedience through what he suffered on the, on the cross. And then verse 9, being made perfect. And so we saw in chapter 2 that when the author of Hebrews talks about being made perfect, he's not saying that Jesus Christ was somehow imperfect prior to his suffering on the cross, and so it needed to be made perfect through that. No, all he is saying that that perfection means that Jesus Christ completed the full course of his mission in submission to God. And so he perfectly achieved our salvation on the cross. So that's what it means. And so being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To all who obey him. Only Jesus Christ can, only, uh, can ever make the claim that God has forgiven your sins in him. Only Jesus Christ can make that claim. The high priest of the old order could never, could never claim that they were the source of, of eternal salvation. Only Christ Jesus can make that claim. And so if it will be true of Christ Jesus, that he is the only, that he is the source of eternal salvation, then that means, as a high priest, that means then verse 10, that he has to have been designated by God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That he has to be a high priest of a different cause. Melchizedek, which we will hear all about in chapter 7. Sure. So I feel like that's a lot, right? To have to sort of kind of comprehend, piece together, and really kind of understand. But like that's what this, the richness of this text in explanation, that's where he's trying to lead us towards. And that's why he's pressing for maturity of understanding. We need a maturity of understanding so that we will understand the foundation upon which Jesus Christ's priesthood is built over our lives. 
which then makes him be, uh, uh, the greatest things we could, uh, could ever uh, experience, that nothing is better than Jesus. And so yes, why I'm going to leave it this morning. I'm going to leave it on some sort of kind of a cliffhanger this morning. Uh, in terms of applications, uh, how do we apply this, this text? And so I'm going to leave it there, there this morning for two particular reasons. The first reason is this, uh, is this that as I said pre- uh, previously, this portion of chapter 5 and chapter 7 that will come are actually two parts trying to explain to us the uniqueness of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so we need both parts if we are to apply it correctly. And so that's why I'm not going to apply it yet. Then the second reason why I'm not going to apply it yet is because where the author of Hebrews will go next in that portion in the middle, his exhortation in the middle, will be quite surprising. And so we will need a time next week to actually unpack his application over what he has said so far. And so I'm going to leave it there for uh, these two reasons. But as you wait and you're dying, well, what should I do? What can I do more as I wait? Then let me leave you with these three things that you can do as you spend time waiting and just thinking about what we're seeing. So the first thing you can do is if anything I've said this morning seems quite like, I I didn't quite get that or whatever, then I want to urge you, re-listen. Re-listen to this uh, uh, message and try to see if perhaps there's something you missed along the way because we need this foundation for where we are going in the book of Hebrews. Then the second thing you can do in the meantime as you wait is actually mediate, uh, uh, sorry, not mediate, meditate on Leviticus 16 and Hebrews 5, this portion together during the course of the week. Meditate on it. See how they correlate. See how they speak and complement one another so that you can actually fully understand uh, stand what are some of the things that we covered this morning. And then the third thing you can do by way of application, if anything is unclear, then reach out to the church. Send out an email, church at bbc.org.za. Or perhaps during the course of the midweek in your gospel community, ask some clarifying questions to your leader so that you can really better understand it because we need this foundation so that we would actually see why nothing is better than Jesus. Let me pray for us. And so Father, there's no doubts that perhaps this morning um, we would have wanted perhaps a, a message that would speak into our finances, message that would speak into our anxieties, a message that might speak into our fears, our hopes, our dreams, the president's address this evening, and, 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 and whether you will say what we are dying to uh, have him say uh, during this crisis. And so we could have turned to many other things this morning to bring comfort, hope, strength, perseverance this time. But Father, in the midst of all those things, and there are real needs that we do need, all of those, as the Apostle Paul would say, count nothing for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. And so in fact, maybe let me just read that portion of Philippians as we as we bring our lives and our hearts before you, desperate for certain things to see you do in our lives, I pray that we will be reminded that you have already done and are doing, doing, or giving and strengthening and building us up in our only hope and our only foundation which is Christ Jesus. And so Philippians 2, 3, verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, my high priest. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness on my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God 
that depends on faith. That I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. I pray that Christ would then be indeed our treasure, the one whom we pursue, the one we, uh, in whom we look to anchor ourselves in, and the one in whom, whom we find, and thereby find all the greatest treasure we could ever long for in this life and in the one that is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.